welcome back to Global Value. Today, we're performing a fundamental stock analysis of Johnson & Johnson. We're looking at the business today because Johnson & Johnson is a dividend king. Dividend kings are members of the S&P 500 who have consecutively increased their dividends for each of the past 50 years. Johnson & Johnson has been in operation for more than 130 years, and they've raised their dividend for more than 60 years in a row, meaning that this business has one of the longest and most impressive histories of any dividend growth stock. Johnson & Johnson is also geared up for a major transformation in their business. They're set to spin off their consumer health segment by November of 2023. So currently, Johnson & Johnson is trading for $154.02 per share. Over their last year, their stock price is down 8.5%. So while their stock price is down, that's actually outperforming the S&P 500 over this period. Johnson & Johnson over the last five years is compounding their stock price at a rate of just over 3% annually. Over their last 10 years, their stock price is compounding at a rate just over 6% annually. And going back prior to the global financial crisis over the last 18 years, Johnson & Johnson is compounding their stock price at a rate of just under 5% annually. Keep in mind that the company's dividend payouts throughout this time frame would be in addition to these compounded annual returns. Johnson & Johnson currently has a pretty above average dividend yield of 2.9%, which is a lot higher than the dividend yield from an S&P 500 ETF currently. Johnson & Johnson's trading about $3 above their 52-week low. The company's down more than $30 from their 52-week high. Johnson & Johnson is one of the largest largest businesses in the world, they have a $401 billion market cap. For more background about the business, Johnson & Johnson is the world's largest and most diverse healthcare firm. Currently, three divisions make up the firm, pharmaceutical, medical devices, and diagnostics, and consumer. The drug and devices group represents close to 80% of sales and drive the majority of cash flows for the firm. The drug division focuses on the following therapeutic areas, immunology, oncology, neurology, pulmonology, cardiology, and metabolic diseases. The device segment focuses on orthopedics, surgery tools, vision care, and a few smaller areas. Areas. And then the last segment of consumer focuses on baby care, beauty, oral care, over-the-counter drugs, and women's health. Geographically, just over half of its total revenue is generated in the United States. As mentioned, Johnson & Johnson's planning to spin off their consumer health business. By November of 2023, this new business will be named Kenview. It includes brands such as Band-Aid, Tylenol, Listerine, and Neutrogena, and generated revenues of $14.5 billion in 2021. Also worth being aware of is that this unit faced nearly 40,000 lawsuits alleging its baby powder and talc products contained asbestos, which were later linked to mesothelioma and ovarian cancer, which the company has denied. Johnson & Johnson was founded in 1886 and is based in New Brunswick, New Jersey. So for our fundamental analysis today, we are performing the Select 6 analysis, taking a checklist-style approach of six standard financial metrics to come to a holistic and beginning understanding of Johnson & Johnson based off their business fundamentals. So this analysis is still a work in progress and it's an opportunity to learn in public, so it will continue to improve and get better over time. With that said, let's get right into today's analysis. Starting things off with metric number one, we want their average return on capital over their last five years to be above 14%. And there are two key reasons for this. The first is that over the long run, over the course of decades, a stock is likely to return approximately what its underlying business returns. And these business returns are going to be captured here by return on capital. The second is that the average publicly listed business earns about a 7% return on capital. So by asking for a benchmark of 14% or higher here, we can potentially build in some margin of safety for ourselves based off the overall quality of the business being about twice as good as average. So Johnson & Johnson has earned pretty stable and pretty steady returns on capital through all five of these years. Their lowest returns were 19% and their highest returns were about 22.5%. Averaged out, Johnson & Johnson's earning about a 21% return on capital in a given year, which is three times better than that of a typical business and one and a half times better than that 14% benchmark we're looking for. So this is a check starting things off here on metric number one for Johnson & Johnson. Next up for metric number two, here we're taking a high level overview of the growth of their business. So we're looking for revenue, net income, and free cash flow growth over their last five years. This metric will be all or nothing in nature. Either all three of these will be up for this to be a check, or if even one of these is down, this entire metric will be an X. So over this time frame, Johnson & Johnson has modestly grown their revenues by 16%. Their net incomes are also up modestly at 17% growth, but however, their free cash flows are down slightly. Their free cash flows have declined by 7% overall, meaning that this is going to be an X here on metric number two. Looking at their cash flow statement, there are a couple of reasons for this. One was because of a large $2.5 
billion dollar change in their inventories. And then the company has also increased their capital expenditure in the most recent year, which was up about $400 million from where they had been at previously. So with these charges and their increase in CapEx, their free cash flows were down. And this is of note because free cash flow is really the lifeblood of any business. And ultimately, a business's abilities to produce free cash flows now and until judgment day, discounted back by some reasonable interest rate, is what that business is going to be worth. So a business can use its free cash flows to make acquisitions, buy back shares, pay down debt, pay dividends, or reinvest back into the business. So it's less than ideal to see that their free cash flows are down over this time. Next up for metric number three, here we're taking the perspective of an individual shareholder in Johnson & Johnson by looking at the company on a per share basis. So we're looking for earnings per share growth over the last five years for the business. As we learned in our previous metric, their earnings are up modestly over this time frame. And during this five-year period, Johnson & Johnson has bought back a slight amount of their shares outstanding. So they bought back two and a half percent of their shares. So with these slight share buybacks, in addition to this modest growth in their earnings, this is earnings per share growth here for Johnson & Johnson. This is a check on metric number three. And in their most recent fiscal year, the company earned $6.73 for each share that they had outstanding. Next up for metric number four, here we're looking for free cash flow per share growth for the business over their last five years. With their free cash flows declining over this time frame and the company buying back a slight percentage of their shares, their free cash flows and their buybacks are going to be at odds here. However, their declines in their free cash flows are slightly outpacing their share buybacks, meaning that their free cash flows per share are down over the last five years. So this is an X on metric number four. And in their most recent fiscal year, Johnson & Johnson produced $6.55 worth of free cash flow for each share that they had outstanding. So recapping where we stand currently, through our first four metrics, we're split evenly. Johnson & Johnson has two checks and two Xs. Next up for metric number five, here we're evaluating how the business is utilizing debt. So we don't want to be investing in overly levered businesses because during economic downturns, it's overly levered businesses that are likely at the greatest risk of poor outcomes. Johnson & Johnson has had a low amount of net debt relative to the free cash flows that they produced as a business overall. They did significantly increase their net debt position in their most recent fiscal year. This was because of an announced deal to acquire heart pump maker Abitomed for $16.6 billion. And that deal is expected to close in March of 2023, and it should be a creative to Johnson & Johnson's earnings in 2024. So even with that increase in their net debt position, right now the business only has $17.4 billion worth of net debt, and over their last five years, the company has produced $95.5 billion worth of free cash flow, meaning that the company looks like it's using a very reasonable and very low amount of debt overall relative to the free cash flows that the business is bringing in. So this is a very strong check here on metric number five, as Johnson & Johnson would be able to pay off their entire net debt position with pretty much just one year's worth of their current free cash flows. Then our sixth and final metric, the big metric of them all, we want their average free cash flow to their enterprise value to give us a yield that's above 5%. If this is the case, this may offer us a reasonable starting place for a valuation of Johnson & Johnson, and it may also offer a small risk premium to the yield of the 10-year treasury. Johnson & Johnson currently has a $418.5 billion total enterprise value, and we're using their total enterprise value because it takes into account both their market cap and their net debt position, and it's going to give us a perspective of Johnson & Johnson that's more similar to as if the company were a private business. As we learned in our previous metric, Johnson & Johnson has produced $95.5 billion worth of free cash flow over their last five years, meaning that in an average year, this company produces $19.1 billion worth of free cash flow. So in absolute terms, that's among the highest of any business in the world. And when we divide their $19.1 billion of their average free cash flow by their $418.5 billion total enterprise value, that gives us about a 4.6% average free cash flow to enterprise value yield for Johnson & Johnson. So that's just very slightly below that 5% risk premium we'd ideally be seeking, but that is above the yield of the 10-year treasury. However, on an average basis here, this is still going to be an X on metric number six for Johnson & Johnson. Also worth being aware of is that their free cash flows over their last 12 months, again, are down slightly from where they've been at historically. So when we divide their $17.2 billion of their most recent fiscal year's free cash flow by their $418.5 billion total enterprise value, that gives us about a 4.1% current free cash flow to enterprise value yield for the business. So we're off here both on an average and a current basis of their free cash flows. And just because this is the case doesn't mean that you're going to toss Johnson & Johnson out in its entirety. This is not a buy or sell recommendation of any security, and this analysis is meant to be holistic in nature. While these metrics are simple, when they're combined together, they can be very powerful. So even though this is our final metric, you'll still want to stick around until the end of the video because we've got some interesting bonuses to cover for Johnson & Johnson. So as a bonus, here we're taking a look at Johnson 
Johnson & Johnson's dividend profile. So again, Johnson & Johnson is a dividend king. They've consecutively increased their dividend payouts for each of the previous 60 years, which gives them one of the longest and most impressive track records of any business in the world. Additionally, Johnson & Johnson is also paying out an above average dividend yield of 2.9%. However, people make mistakes all the time by blindly chasing dividends, so it's important to stop and look at the underlying fundamentals of a business and to determine whether that company's abilities to pay out dividends are well supported by either their earnings or their free cash flows depending on the type of business. So for Johnson & Johnson, we want their dividends to be supported by their free cash flows, and that's been the case in all five of these years. Even though their free cash flows are down slightly, it looks like Johnson & Johnson has comfortably been able to support their dividend payouts. And with Johnson & Johnson employing a very modest and moderate amount of debt in their business relative to their free cash flows, it looks like their dividend profile should be in pretty healthy and sustainable shape going forward for the company. Keep in mind that this is a snapshot of their last five years of their performance, and even though their dividend payout ratio has increased over this time, it still looks like they're able to support their dividends. Again though, this is no guarantee for the future. Then everything we've discussed so far is important, but there's something missing that in my opinion is the main reason to analyze Johnson & Johnson, which takes us on to using a discounted cash flow model to come to a potential fair intrinsic value for Johnson & Johnson. A discounted cash flow model is based off a business's predictability, and specifically the predictability of their free cash flows. A DCF model is also just like any other model in any other discipline. Its outputs are going to be sensitive to its inputs. So here we're starting with an average of Johnson & Johnson's free cash flows over their last three years and using historical growth assumptions dating back all the way till 1990 in order to project these out into the future. So it's up to you to do your own homework here to determine whether or not these historical growth assumptions are going to be accurate and applicable going forward. For if we assume that they grow their average free cash flows at a rate of just over 10% annually over their next 10 years, and then during the 10 years out after that, that this growth rate would be cut in half to growing at 5% annually. If we were seeking a 15% rate of return, which is the rate of return that Warren Buffett is looking for from his investments, keep in mind that he's also looking for margin of safety requirements depending on the dynamics of the industry that a business operates in as well as that business's competitive positioning relative to its peers in his determination of whether that business truly possesses a durable competitive advantage or not. So looking for those criteria, it looks like at today's valuations of Johnson & Johnson that a potential fair intrinsic value for the business is just below $87 per share. So that would be almost half of what the company's current stock price is at. Keep in mind that this 15% rate of return would be including their dividends, so we would not be doubly counting their 2.9% dividend yield, and that would be captured here. Also, this would be far outpacing total returns to shareholders from Johnson & Johnson over their last two decades. Again, a discounted cash flow model is based off a business's predictability, and Johnson & Johnson has tended to have a higher degree of business predictability than some other types of businesses in the past. However, that's not necessarily a guarantee for anything going forward into the future. Please be mindful of the fact that this type of analysis is not financial advice. It's not a buy or sell recommendation of any security. And before considering any potential investment decision, please consult with the properly licensed and registered legal and financial professionals. In just a minute, we'll talk about our summary for Johnson & Johnson, but we have to address something first. What are some of the qualitative aspects of this business? So starting with some of the key points around a potential long thesis for the business. Number one, several of Johnson & Johnson's key drug and pipeline drugs are specialty drugs that tend to carry strong pricing power as well as lower regulatory hurdles for approval. Number two, diverse healthcare segments help insulate Johnson & Johnson from downturns in the economy, offering a defensive growth opportunity with a steady and likely growing dividend. And number three, the majority of Johnson & Johnson's near-term patent losses are for products that are hard to manufacture, which should limit the intensity of generic competition. Competition. Then for some of the key points around a potential short thesis of the business, number one, several of Johnson & Johnson's important drugs are facing increased competition, which could slow the growth rate of the drug group. Number two, legal action regarding talc powder and opioid drugs could cost billions of dollars and create distractions for management. And number three, Johnson & Johnson's late stage drug pipeline is relatively weak for the size of the company, which could create long-term hurdles for growth. So hopefully that offers a balanced perspective around some of the key qualitative aspects of Johnson & Johnson's business. Business. Now it's time for a summary. So Johnson & Johnson checks the box on three of our six metrics today, meaning that Johnson & Johnson is moderately attractive for further research. The company earns average returns on capital that are three times better than that of a typical business. 
Well, they have grown their revenues and their earnings moderately over the last five years. Their free cash flows are down. At the same time, Johnson & Johnson has bought back a slight amount of their shares. Even with their free cash flows being down, it looks like the company is massively cash flow generative relative to the debt that they employ. And when we looked at the business's average and current free cash flow to enterprise value yields and compared those to the yield of the 10-year treasury, it looks like those were just slightly below that risk premium that we'd be seeking on both an average and a current basis. Looking at Johnson & Johnson's dividend, again, Johnson & Johnson has paid out consecutively increasing dividends for each of the past 60 years. That while they've increased increase their dividends and their free cash flows have declined somewhat, meaning that they now have a higher dividend payout ratio than they have in the past. It still looks like Johnson & Johnson was healthily able to support their dividend payouts in all five of the previous years using their free cash flows. Then finally, performing a discounted cash flow analysis of Johnson & Johnson. If you've done the work and you believe that those historical growth assumptions are going to be accurate and applicable going forward for the business, and you were seeking a 15% rate of return, then it looks like from today's valuations of the business that a reasonable, fair, intrinsic value for Johnson & Johnson is around $87 per share. Again, that would be far below their current stock price, but that rate of return would be dramatically outperforming how the business has fared over their past two decades or so. Keep in mind also that there are reasons why that may not be accurate, so it's worth reiterating that this type of analysis is not financial advice, it's not a buy or sell recommendation of any security, and before considering any potential investment decision, please consult with your financial advisor. This analysis instead serves as a beginning and holistic understanding to help you determine whether it's worth your time and energy to dig in and learn more about Johnson & Johnson. One resource that will definitely help you stay up to speed with what's going on in the market and help you learn more about the business is Seeking Alpha. Checking out Seeking Alpha directly supports the channel as I'm part of their affiliate program. So most of you probably know Seeking Alpha as a source of community written articles on different stocks. But over the past little while, they've actually become a lot more than that with their new offering, which is Seeking Alpha Premium. Premium has a number of different features where you can track buy, hold, and sell ratings on your favorite stocks. These ratings are from the Seeking Alpha community, Wall Street analysts, and Seeking Alpha's algorithm. You can see earnings call transcripts, investor presentations, SEC filings, and press releases all in one place. You can add your own margin of safety targets and get alerts for when your favorite stocks hit that level. You can get unlimited access to Seeking Alpha articles, and you can tailor your reading experience based on the type of investor you are. You can get 10 years of financial data on any stock to help you with your analysis. You can also import your portfolio into your Seeking Alpha dashboard to make researching easier. And if that didn't convince you, the best thing is that an annual plan is only 119 bucks. That's just 33 cents per day through my referral link down in the description below. Normally premium is $239, but if you use my link, it's 50% off. So check it out if you're interested. So through this deeper research, you'll learn more about the qualitative and the quantitative aspects of Johnson & Johnson, and you'll likely be able to determine for yourself what a reasonably appropriate intrinsic value for the company will be. As a value investor, you're ultimately trying to conduct this research as if you're going to own 100% of a business, and you can research the business accurately, completely, and then go back and ask yourself, what did you miss? In order to understand the underlying essence of the business and to understand what's going to matter and what's not going to matter for the company going forward. So with that said, that's it for today's fundamental stock analysis of Johnson & Johnson, ticker symbol JNJ. Again, we looked at the business because of its dividend king status and Johnson & Johnson with its planned spinoff and their recent acquisition has had some interesting news around the business. So I'm happy to make an analysis of the company. And if you enjoyed today's video, please be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel for more stock analysis videos, and comment down below what business you want me to take a look at next time. Thanks for learning about Johnson & Johnson with me and have a great day.